From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Voters go to the polls in Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and beyond. Let's take a look at what's at stake and what these results might tell us about the electorate heading into 2024. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with The Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, editorial board members Kate Batchelder odell and Mene Ukwe-Barua. It's Election Day in America, not only in those four states, but from sea to shining sea, there are state constitutional amendments in Maine, school board races in California, and everything in between. Possibly some teaching moments for parents this morning at the polls. Kids, this is where they get you. These off-year local bond referenda sneaking through tax increases when they think nobody's looking. But the national attention tonight will be focused mainly on a handful of places. And let's start in Virginia, where Governor Glenn Youngkin is stretching, hoping to take unified control of the state legislature. Here he is this morning on Fox & Friends talking about what's at stake. I do think that the nation is watching what's happening in Virginia. Why? Because they need hope, too. A state that was just 22 months ago lost, has completely taken a right turn, has forged a new path forward, and Virginians are absolutely on board with holding our house and flipping our Senate. Kate, what's the story in Virginia, and what can Glenn Youngkin accomplish if he gets the kind of sweep in tonight's elections that he hopes for. So I think Governor Yunkin deserves credit for putting a lot of his political capital on the line to try to flip the state Senate and consolidate GOP control in Virginia. It's been a decade since the Republicans have run a trifecta, as it's called, of government in Virginia. It is still, I think, despite his efforts and his traveling all around the state in these competitive places such as Hampton Roads in the southeast, suburban Richmond, and pockets of northern Virginia, where all of these contested close elections are, it's still a bit of an uphill battle for Yunkin. In his favor, there are more retirements than usual, and redistricting means that there are a decent amount of vacancies. And he's also got a pretty sophisticated early voting operation that he's been saying will help close the early voting advantage that Democrats have. But the fundamentals of these races are still tough, and I'd love to take you on a little tour here. In the Senate is really where I would encourage folks to watch tonight. The House looks a little bit more firmly like Republicans have an ability to hold their in majority, but the Senate is really the one to watch. It's going to be a squeaker. So there are seven really competitive swing districts to watch tonight across the state in Virginia. Biden carried six of them. Trump carried one of them in Fredericksburg. That's in 2020. But then the following year in 2021, Glenn Youngkin, when he ran, he carried four of them. And he needs to carry four again tonight to get a majority in the Senate. And it's not going to be easy to repeat those successes. And in 2022, across these seven swing districts, congressional Democrats won all seven of them. So basically what Youngkin's got to do is hold those four seats. And they're in places, like I said, Fredericksburg, Tara Durant, Marine Wife, places on the peninsula like Danny Diggs, Sheriff, who's trying to unseat Monty Mason, a Democratic incumbent. But the seats that I would really look closely tonight if you're trying to get a bellwether of what's going to happen are in Loudoun County, which Youngkin won by less than one point. And Republicans have put up a candidate named Juan Pablo Seguara and also the 16th Senate District in suburban Richmond. This is a district that McAuliffe, Youngkin's opponent, carried by six points. But it could still be competitive because you've got a very moderate GOP incumbent named Siobhan Donovant who is an OBGYN who has been in tough races before and is running a serious campaign. So my overall take, Kyle, is it's going to be a squeaker. But to your question about what Kenya can do, well, the Senate has really kept him from accomplishing a number of his priorities, including cutting the corporate tax rate and shaving off the top rate on personal income. It's kept him from more modest things like wanting to put fentanyl dealers in jail if someone dies from an overdose. A number of priorities, including a potential 15-week limit on abortions that Governor Yunkin supports. So it is a real test for Yunkin, but also his message more generally. He's got a high 50s approval rating, which is really impressive in a blue state like Virginia. And it will be a fascinating race to watch tonight to see if he can defy political gravity and pull this off. Many, there's been some talk of Glenn Youngkin as a potential future presidential candidate, including that he might jump into the 2024 race as a late entrant if he succeeds in these elections today. 
And I'm not sure where I put the odds of that. Some of the filing deadlines in New Hampshire, for example, have already passed to get on the New Hampshire ballot. The filing deadline was Friday earlier this month. That's when Dean Phillips went up to New Hampshire to put his hat in the Democratic ring there. But it does strike me that Glenn Youngkin has a pretty appealing message to be able to win as a Republican in a purple or a a state that was trending blue like Virginia, where the growth of the suburbs and a lot of government workers there has made that a tough state for Republicans. But even if he wants to do that sometime potentially after 2024 and in 2028, it sure would help him if he could get unified control and pass kind of a Yunkin agenda, because part of the difficulty there in these states with divided government is you go out as a gubernatorial candidate on the campaign trail and you talk about what you want to do, and then you spend two or four years banging your head against the wall in a capital like Richmond, where you can't get the things that you promised through a legislature held by the opposing party. Exactly. I think it's important to start out by understanding what the case for Yunkin's national political appeal would be. He was elected in 2021, a couple of years ago, during the period when the country was reckoning with the COVID lockdowns and these issues about the control of public schools. He was running against Terry McAuliffe, who very famously on the debate stage said that he didn't want parents to be the main people in charge of their children's education. And that really allowed an opening for Youngkin to propose an alternative message around which conservatives all throughout the country were coalescing at that time, saying that they want to be in charge of their children's education, both in the public schools, but also to have more options for how their children were being educated. And so Yunkin was able to combine this appeal to suburban voters with the practical merits of good governance, particularly schools. And he also managed to distance himself from Trump without alienating conservative voters in downstate Virginia who he needed to turn out in order to be elected. And now he obviously is trying to see if he can actually govern in that direction, again, in a way that appeals to a lot of the moderates. And there are quite a few of them, particularly in upstate Virginia and the D.C. area, but also that touches a lot of conservative priorities. And so that's essentially the case for his governorship, what he hopes to be able to do if he can reclaim that Senate majority, and also theoretically would be the case for him as a presidential candidate, because those are the same constituencies that a GOP presidential nominee will have to appeal to. I do think that the filing deadlines, as you said, are a big barrier. That's something that he has acknowledged in public. It would be logistically very difficult and also to begin raising money for a race at this late stage. I also think, frankly, Nikki Haley has kind of taken part of the lane that naturally might have been his in terms of appealing to more moderate voters in the GOP, having a record as a serious governor who also managed to have conservative bona fides. And so the need for his entry into the contest seems less urgent now when it was unclear who might be able to fill that spot. And so I think right now the result in Virginia is much more about what he's able to accomplish in that state, setting up a potential presidential run. Kate, what about the issue of abortion? How is Glenn Youngkin and how are his endorsed candidates handling that? Because A part of the lackluster Republican results in the 2022 midterms, it seems to me, was a response to Democratic enthusiasm after the overturning of Roe v. Wade. I think you could say the same for some special elections and some referenda that we've seen results in earlier this year. How is that playing out in these Virginia legislative elections? Well, I'd first say it's not the top issue that Republicans are talking about on the campaign trail. I think Republican candidates in Virginia are really honing their message on taxes in the economy and education, which was the issue that propelled Governor Youngkin to the governorship, and public safety as Virginia has spikes in crime in certain areas like most of the country. So those are the top issues that Republicans are really focused on and are using as their real campaign message. But of course, the Democrats are making abortion a huge issue because it has been proven so electorally successful in other parts of the country of getting Democrats to come out and vote. Governor Youngkin favors a 15-week limitation on abortion, but it's a very permissive abortion regime in Virginia. What Youngkin, I think, has done here, one thing that matters, of course, is the quality of the candidate who is talking about abortion. I use the example of suburban Richmond, where one of these competitive races is a GOP candidate, Siobhan Donavant, who is out in suburban Richmond. She is an OBGYN 
And she has been talking about this issue, I think, with the particular credibility of having cared for women in pregnancy. And so she says, I favor a 15-week limit, no earlier, but I delivered a 23-week baby before, um, only a couple years ago, who now is alive and healthy as a toddler. So I think she brings that credibility to the issue that Republicans have been struggling to find. And also, I think 15 weeks, as we've talked about here and elsewhere, is a compromised position that most of the country can support. And also, you know, with reasonable exceptions for when a mother's health is in danger or for rape and incest. And this is a kind of compromised position that I think most voters support. And Youngkin has been saying, I think we can agree that we can improve on where Virginia is now. So this is not a heartbeat bill, and it's not perhaps what some pro-life advocates would prefer. But the question here is whether Democrats are going to be able to repeat their tactic of frightening everybody about what the Republicans might do on abortion, when I think Republicans have at least addressed the issue directly and put out a position that most people can accept as reasonable. (laughs) 